Let's pray this together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Well, welcome to Restoration Church Online. I'm so glad that you are here. My name's Kurt. I'm one of the pastors here. And thanks for joining us as we jump into a brand new conversation together called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. My hope is that over these next eight weeks that we spend together, we would actually begin to explore and even adopt a a more emotionally healthy view of what it looks like to love and follow Jesus. That as we embrace this kind of new way that is really not new at all, it's it's an ancient path that Jesus originally invited us to, that the byproduct would be a restorative healing in our relationships. That we would be restored as individuals, as families, in our community, and even the church as a whole within our world would see a redemptive step forward. Now, I know that that's a big goal, and that's not just going to happen because we talk about this topic for the next eight weeks. But as we introduce this conversation as a church, and if as a church we actually begin to practice these ideas, that these eight principles will show up in our life over these next eight years, perhaps, we're going to really see a difference. This is something that we want to move our old way of thinking out of the way, and as the scriptures say, be transformed by the renewing of our mind, a new way to see the world and a new way to see how can we love and follow Jesus together. And the good news is that Jesus promised us that when this happens, people will actually see and know that we are following him by the way that we live and by the way that we act. See, our mission at Restoration Church is to empower all people to love and follow Jesus. And and yet we exist in the midst of the Protestant tradition of Christianity, which, let's be honest, has done a really great job over the last couple hundred years specifically educating people about the idea that Jesus is the Son of God, and that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. The Protestant tradition is known for giving a really great you know, overview of theology and specifically the scriptures, but perhaps in our attempt to be more theologically educated, we have actually missed the profound, simplistic invitation of Jesus to simply love and follow him. And what we've learned over this last year together in the midst of pandemic is that a complacent Christianity or a kind of haphazard church attendance really doesn't do anybody any good. I mean, if you can go over six months without something, you really probably don't need it that much in your life. And so that's why this conversation is so important. And that's why we're having it today. And I'm so excited for these principles to really find their way into your life and mine. And that as a community, our, our area here in San Diego would actually experience restoration. They would experience what we call ourselves. And here's the good news, right? Is that while these topics, this conversation may be challenging, it may ask more of you than perhaps other conversations you've engaged in, it might invite you and invite me to kind of lay aside our masks of pretending and performing and actually show up and be real, which that can be scary, right? Our hope is that as we do that, as we step into this conversation, that we would not only experience a safe place before God and with each other, but that we would more fully and freely swim in the ocean of grace and love that God has for you. But see, here's, here's the big idea for today and really for this entire series, is that you and I, we cannot actually become more spiritually mature without becoming more emotionally mature. Now, if you're like me, perhaps you grew up around church or grew up around Christianity, or maybe you're here joining us for the first time or the first time in a long time, and if you're honest, you're wondering, well, what is this difference? What does it look like to actually have an emotionally healthy spirituality? And it might be a helpful place to start is to ask, what does emotionally unhealthy spirituality actually look like? And the troubling thing is, is the answer to that question is very obvious. It's, in fact, all around us that we see emotionally unhealthy spirituality when we use God to hide from God, when our biggest calling card as followers of Jesus is that we correct other people, or that we over-spiritualize conflict, 
or that you and I can so easily kind of divide our life into the sacred and the secular and there's no overlap. And so there's spaces in our life and in our week where we don't even think about God, that we don't know how to invest and cultivate a spiritual connection with Jesus. And we see the drastic effects of this play out, sometimes even on the national stage, when leaders of the Christian world are found out that there's something happening behind the scenes that none of us would applaud and none of us would say, I want to be like that. And we find ourselves facing grief and frustration. And really all along it's because the performative aspect of our spirituality has been elevated beyond the actual intrinsic transformation that Jesus invites you and me to. Now, it's important to note that a person can actually become emotionally healthy without Jesus, right? There are plenty of people who are more balanced, loving, and kind than many churchgoers that I know, and they would not consider themselves followers of Jesus at all. They go to counseling or they're involved in a 12-step group, and they're very centered and honest. They're easy to be around because they are aware of their flaws and they're receptive to others not being perfect either. And at the same time, a person can be good at prayer or regularly attend church or even spend time reading the scriptures and yet remain emotionally immature and socially maladjusted. That in spite of their perceived spirituality or perhaps even because of it, if we're honest, they can become narcissistic or unaware or judgmental in nature. They can be defensive or touchy and they see this as there's no correlation between their inner life and their spirituality. Now, it's important before we go forward that we define what emotional health actually is. And I say it this way, that emotional health is the ability to be both self-aware and love others well. To be self-aware, to know who I am, and to love others well. And this actually comes from the greatest commandment where Jesus responds to a religious leader asking the question that they hoped would stump him. And they show up and they say, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Or what command of God is most important? And Jesus says this, he quotes the Shema and it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then before they could interrupt him, he continues and said, and another is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says all the other things that God has said actually hang on these two things. They're like pegs that you can hang things off of because they're that important. Now here's the reality is that if we want to have a church culture that actually changes lives, where we see people maturing, we have to let go of the old metrics of attendance or small group participation or even serving. Those are great things, but we really have to be able to ask the question, what is deeper than that? Because transformation actually only takes place with the slow, long following of a crucified Jesus. And this is even more challenging in a me-first, manifesting, postmodern, social media-saturated world where clicks and likes and applause and productivity make up the pantheon of gods in our day, even within the church. Father Richard Rohr is actually famous for saying that the greatest threat to our following a crucified Christ is not the temptation of any particular sin, but actually the pursuit of success. Without realizing it, we become human doings rather than human beings. And so we have to stop compartmentalizing God into only the perceived spiritual activities in our life. We have to break free from the unhealthy or destructive patterns that we've inherited from our culture of origin or even our family and live into a new family, the family of Jesus together. But this will require inviting Jesus into new places in our life. Because the truth is, is that you and I, we will only transform to the level in which we invite Jesus into our life. On the surface, that sounds easy. Oh, don't you just invite Jesus into your life or not? It's so easy for us to think it's black and white, a binary experience. But Jesus says, actually, there's, there's layers. And we even see this in his life with his original followers, that there were people that were really close to him. There were people that were kind of on the periphery. And then there were even those that people thought were on the inside that ended up leaving him, betraying him, and even denying him. Now, now this is what's so important is because we are invited to live our life the way Jesus lived his life. This whole idea of emotionally healthy spirituality came from a pastor named Pete Schizero, and he writes in his book of the same title, he says, scripture portrays Jesus as one who had intense, raw, and emotional experiences and was able to express his emotions in unashamed and unembarrassed freedom to others. 
He didn't repress them, he didn't put them down, or he didn't project them or push them out onto others, but instead we see Jesus responsibly experiencing the full range of human emotion through his earthly ministry. This is so important. We can so often, you know, focus on Jesus being the son of God, and that's extremely important. But he was also fully human. He was a full-fledged human being, and he had the full human experience. And when we push aside any of our emotions, we actually miss out on what Jesus invites us to experience in our humanity. See, we want to be the kind of community that, that meets with Jesus and experiences his grace, not only in the successes, but also in the failures, in the losses, in the struggles. That we want to be able to celebrate fully and also grieve well. And so what does it actually look like to love and follow Jesus? Well, someone else asked him that, and he responded this way. And I wonder if it resonates with you right now, especially this year. Jesus asks, are you tired? Are you burned out on religion? He said, come and get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Watch how I do it. Work with me. I will teach you the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't put anything ill-fitting or heavy on you. Follow me and I will show you that you can live my way freely and lightly. See, the way of Jesus is not an emotional one. It's an emotion-full one. And so here's what we're going to explore in this conversation for the next eight weeks. We're going to discuss how do we know ourselves so that we can know God? What do we need to explore within our own story to understand fully the story of God? We're going to explore our iceberg. We're going to learn how do we go beneath the surface to what's really going on. The things that show up, they came from somewhere. We're going to explore that. We're going to learn how do we work with God and not just for God and learn how to embrace rest and limits as a path to spirituality. We're going to engage perhaps with the hardest emotions we might feel of grief and loss and rather than resist them, invite them as a spiritual practice. We're going to learn how to fight fair and really engage in integrity in our living so that we can become a fully emotionally healthy adult. And we're going to learn how to develop a rule of life, a filter through which all the decisions that you and I make can be put through so that we can actually end up where we would like to go. So before we conclude, I just want to ask you, how is this sitting for you? Like right now, when when you hear me talk about this, when you hear this perspective on who Jesus was, Does it feel new? Does it cause fear? Does it make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Are are you leaning in with anticipation? Or are you kind of pushing back with resistance? Let's just be honest for a minute. Give yourself 10 seconds. Check in. How is this even feeling for you? Because see, our homework for this week is actually exactly that. It's quite simple. It's to actually engage with whatever emotion might be present at any given moment. I remember a counselor of mine once shared with me uh, that emotions are actually just energy moving in our body. That emotions show up when something is moving. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where maybe either yourself or you're sitting across from someone and they share something that's either really exciting or, or maybe even challenging or, or perhaps was even traumatic or painful and they begin to cry, they begin to well up with emotion and then they immediately apologize for it. And I remember I had that experience in a therapist's chair and she leaned over and she said, don't apologize for your emotions. Your emotions are the sign of something moving. And then she said something I'll never forget. She said, isn't that the essence of spirituality? And again, as as a pastor for years, I had never thought about that perspective before. And yet it's so clearly true in the life of Jesus. We see him experience the full range of human emotion, joy, excitement, fear, anger, sadness, deep grief, right? That this is the God that we follow after. This is the way and the invitation of Jesus for you and for me is to simply allow him to lead us to whatever emotion we might be feeling and in that space actually find God waiting for us right there. So if emotions are just energy in motion, like my counselor said, if they're just a signal, whether positive or negative, that something is moving, right, and that that is actually the essence of spiritual formation, that we would be changing and growing, evolving and transforming, then you and I, you're not an emotional or non-emotional person, 
right? There, there's no like binary you know, assessment of that. Your emotions, they exist. And, and they're actually not just there for you. They're a gift from God. They're a way that you've been designed to kind of signal you, to let you know what is happening inside your soul. Kind of like the dashboard to your car, the lights and the, and the things that are on there or on your computer that let you know what's happening. Your emotions, right, are something that signal what's going on deep within your being, deep within your soul. And the healthiest thing that we can do when we notice them is to simply allow them to be. Right? So often we brush past them out of busyness or fear, or if we're honest, we've just never been given permission to let them be what they are. And so we try to stuff them down or, or put them off for later or, or try to really immediately find out where they're coming from and figure them out like there's some problem to be solved. And so for this week, for your homework, would you just embrace the gift of your emotions? Whether you're uh, you know, working or with your kids or running an errand, whether you get a phone call that you didn't expect or whatever it might be, would you ask the question, how am I feeling right now? Maybe you set an alarm in your phone or you put it on your watch or maybe you download the Mind Jogger app so it just randomly asks you that question throughout your week. But can you honestly, without judging yourself, without wishing you felt another way, can you ask and accept and receive the gift that your soul is trying to tell you and listen to your emotions. What am I feeling right now? Am I, am I happy? Am I sad? Am I angry? Am I scared? Am I feeling kind of burnt out or tired or tender? Am I excited or am I fearful? When you get out of a meeting with your coworker, how are you feeling? When you're waiting to pick up your kid in the carpool lane from school, how are you feeling? When you get that bill, how are you feeling? When you have a phone call with your in-laws, how are you feeling? When you're getting the kids to bed, how do you feel? When you don't get complimented by your boss in the Zoom meeting or when you're waiting in the doctor's office again, can you simply name what you're feeling? Again, receive it as a gift. Honestly, without judgment, without wishing it was something different, can you listen to what your soul is trying to tell you through your emotions? So that's your homework this week. A couple times a day, set an alarm, whatever it might be, ask yourself the question, how am I feeling? And then join us again next week as we continue this conversation, looking inward, knowing yourself so that you can better know God. Let me pray for you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we hold our hands open to ask that you would actually do a great work in us over these next weeks in this conversation. Would you strip away the layers of any part of us that doesn't belong to you? And as scary or as vulnerable or as exposing as that may feel at times, would we recognize that our status before you never changes because of what we celebrated last week at Easter, that you love us and gave yourself for us to bring us back into a restored relationship with God. But then you invite us to love and follow you. And there is beautiful, transformative, sanctifying work for us to pursue. That life with you, Jesus, is so much more than knowing the right answer or doing the right things. But it often looks like something that maybe we would like to avoid, of really getting honest, of really asking hard questions and taking moral inventories of where we are, what we're feeling, and why. And so I pray this week, as a first step down this path, down this journey, that we would simply be able to recognize what we're feeling. That we would pause long enough, a couple points throughout our day, each day this week, to simply ask the question, what am I feeling? What's here now? And that you would meet us in that place. We pray this in your name, Jesus, the one who is fully God and fully human and who invites us to follow. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you were here today. Again, please join us as we continue this series uh, and continue to explore what it looks like to have a more emotionally healthy spirituality. I'm sure you'll be glad that you did. Well, before we continue in our online worship experience, I want to give you an opportunity to actually give back to God and respond with generosity to his incredible goodness to you. If you're joining us for the first time, please don't feel any obligation to give, but we want you to know that you are in the midst of a digital experience that is really provided for you and all of us because of the faithful 
generosity of so many who call Restoration Church home. And so if you would like to participate, if you would like to give financially to help this mission continue to move forward, I would invite you to do so in one of three really easy ways. You can give online, set up a one-time or reoccurring gift at restorationchurchsd.com slash give. Uh, That's the way my family and I choose to do it so we can have automatic continued faithfulness to what God is doing here at Restoration Church. It not only grows our hearts for him and for others, but it also helps move this mission forward. You could give that way. If you have your phone and you want to give via text, you could text any amount in the message to the number 84321. You'll get a text response back. Simply click that and select Restoration Church San Diego as your giving destination, or you can mail a check here to our building. But however it is that you choose to give, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for participating with us. Thank you for moving our mission forward. You are a stakeholder in all that God is doing, all the transformation that's taking place here at Restoration Church as we empower all people to love and follow Jesus. We are so grateful for you. Well, we're going to close out our worship experience with one more song as we worship this Jesus who invites us to love him and to love others. So will you sing out with us as we wrap up our worship experience? Thanks for being here today at Restoration Church Online.